Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I am bringing you guys a flash sale haul from February, and I know it's March right now, and you guys are probably wondering why I'm doing this so late. Uh, but the thing is, I was putting out all those other videos at the time, and I just didn't have time to do this. And the thing is, the haul isn't even that big. I, I only got like about five films, so hopefully this will be brisk, but I'm bringing it to you now, because better now than never. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and yeah, let's just get started. Now the first film I want to talk about is 1998's Following, which is directed by Christopher Nolan and uh, stars Alex Haw and Jeremy Theobald. The basic premise of the movie is a guy who follows people in their everyday lives to get information that he can use in his novels. So everything is seemingly going well up until he starts following this one specific guy and the guy finally confronts him and says, hey man, why are you following me? From that point on, down the rabbit hole we go when we find out that this guy is sort of a common thief and he goes and breaks into people's houses and takes very particular things, things of really no interest to anyone else other than himself. And so then he starts to follow along with this guy and gets swept up in the whole thievery. However, that's just sort of the surface level idea of what this movie really is. This movie does have a lot of twists and turns that I really enjoyed, but the things that I really liked most about this movie that really stood out was its style. Now this film was originally shot on 60mm and it really stands out in how this film is shot. You can see the grain structure in the movie and in this Criterion release it looks really really good, especially in black and white. And that's one of the things I actually really enjoyed about the movie. The fact that it feels like a student kind of put it together, but a really smart student, which Nolan is sort of now a master at his craft at this point, even though some of the issues that I find with his movies now are sort of seen in this movie, uh, particularly the exposition that's given to our protagonist. It is very heavy on exposition, but the thing about Nolan's movies that I've always really enjoyed is that whenever the exposition is being given to certain characters, it's done in a very stylish way, a way that, you know, doesn't feel like it's padding. It doesn't feel like it's, you know, dragging on sometimes. Sometimes you're drawn into it because they're walking through interesting places or doing something interesting or they look cool while doing it. And essentially that's sort of what the bare bones structure is in this movie that lends to all of Nolan's other movies. Uh, but the thing is, for his most recent film, and I think this is just me talking about Tenet, for Tenet it didn't work for me just because there were so many of those scenes. I think what didn't work for Tenet works better in this movie because this is a lot shorter of a movie and it's a lot tighter of a plot and there aren't too many big concepts that we have to follow. It's fairly simple, there are some twists like I said, but they're really easy to track and when you see everything kind of tie up in the end, uh, it, it's just, it's it's not as mind-blowing as Memento or Prestige or anything like that, but it is really cool that he had this idea at such an early stage in his career. Like I said, this film is brisk. It's around 70 minutes long. It goes by quickly because the writing and overall the style of the movie kind of draws you in. And when it's over, you didn't even realize 70 minutes has gone by. So it's one of those kinds of movies that I really liked. But one of the things that I really stood out for me specifically is the lighting of the movie and the way that he sort of shot this film guerrilla style just because I believe him and his friends when they were making this movie and they're all in film school at the time uh, they were shooting this on weekends or anytime that they weren't working they were kind of putting this all together in the best way that they could using the resources that they had and could afford and so there's a lot of use of natural light and open windows to use for uh, scenes of dialogue or any kind of scene where they need some exposure they need some sort of lighting. They'll always be next to a window or they'll be by a cafe exposed area where there's a lot of natural light flooding in. So really cool ways that they can light this movie and it's really really beautiful on black and white and it really stands out because it's done on black and white. So a lot of the things are adding to the benefit of this film that were actually needing to be done because of their restrictions that they had making this movie. So it actually ends up being a lot cooler, it adds a nice little backstory to this movie, and it's just really interesting and overall I really like this movie. <coughs> I was really trying to hold back a cough during that entire little spiel that I just had. Man, <laughs> my chest is burning. Anyways, that's following. I hope you guys pick this one up because it's really special. And if you guys are a fan of Nolan, this is an essential to have. But yeah, following. Check it out. I'm feeling like a bad girl today, so I'm going to put my hair down. <laughs> okay, that feels 
a lot better. Okay, so let's get into the next movie. The next film I want to talk about is Yasujiro Ozu's Good Morning. This film stars a lot of Ozu's most frequent collaborators, but specifically Chishu Ryu and Masahiko Shimazu. It's hard to tie this film down to one singular genre because it sort of balances between a family drama and a comedy, but leans more into the comedy side, which you don't really see in a lot of Ozu's films. Uh, and that's what I really appreciate about this movie. Ohio or Good Morning is a movie that centers around these two boys who are trying to get their family to get a TV because they're constantly going to their friend's house that's literally right across the road from them and they try to watch sumo wrestling to avoid studying and do all those other things and so their parents are just getting frustrated they're saying hey you guys need to study your English what are you guys doing why are you guys always going over to your neighbor's house and watching sumo wrestling on the TV and the boys say hey we would stay home if we had a TV you know a classic kids excuse for getting what they want is we would do this if we had this so I don't know maybe you should get it essentially this is a slice of life comedy about the interactions between these neighbors and how they are all sort of missing each other in terms of communication and how they all sort of gossip behind each other's back because no one is really saying what they really mean and everyone is just you know behaving as all people do you know everyone's being generally nice saying pleasantries and they go about their days without really communicating any useful information and that's one of the things I really like about this movie is that it talks about that it talks about human interaction it talks about human communication and how we are so focused on pleasantries and saying the things that everyone's used to like Ohio or good morning or good night or how was your day how was the weather things like that that don't really add any benefit to anyone's I don't know idea of who you are as a person nothing really beneficial going on there other than you know just being pleasant and that's one of the things I really liked about this movie because it was a lot more than I was expecting there are just a lot of great things and moments in this movie that make it so iconic and so memorable and there are things about this movie that many people have heard of like the farts but don't let that scare you away from it it's not done in a distasteful way in fact it's done very tastefully and the way that the farts are presented in the movie are very cute and and even the sound effects for them are just really cute and innocent. You just think of, you know, kids being kids uh, throughout the entire movie, even though there are some adults in the movie that fart <laughs> and it's sort of a recurring joke. But yeah, this movie just has everything in terms of something you just want to turn on when it's a rainy day and you just want to feel some little bit of joy. And also the Criterion release looks specifically for this movie looks really really good you can see so many details in the buildings that you see in the movie and the colors look really fantastic and just the way that Ozu shoots his films are just really particular it's very structured and it looks really good the composition looks beautiful and yeah there's just so much to enjoy about this movie and I highly recommend you pick it up I'm sure many of you guys have already picked it up but if you haven't I highly recommend you do so good morning by Ozu big recommendation now the next film I want to talk about is a movie that was released in 1957. It is a timeless classic and it's a movie I should have seen sooner. That movie is 12 Angry Men directed by Sidney Lumet. At its core this movie is essentially a courtroom drama about 12 jurors who have to decide on the fate of a young man who is accused of killing his father and that's pretty much the basic premise but this movie delves in so much deeper and I am so ashamed of myself for not being able to see this sooner because I was for some reason holding off on watching this movie for such a long time because it was on my big list of classic movies that I need to see before I die and the fact that this is just a movie that I've been you know keeping myself away from it's it's such a tragedy because this movie is fantastic this screenplay is one of the best I've ever seen it's one of the best adapted teleplay or stage plays done on a film that I have ever witnessed and it's just amazing amazing work from Sidney Lumet and amazing acting from Lee J Cobb and Henry Fonda and you can say so much more about all the other actors in this film too because everyone equally stands out like I said it's hard to pick just one particular performance but the two performances that really do stand out are Henry Fonda and Lee J Cobb because they are sort of the opposing forces behind this movie they're sort of on opposite ends of whether this boy is guilty or not but amongst that spectrum of other people there are the other 10 jurors that are sort of just needing to be persuaded on one side or the other one thing that's really hard about this movie is you can't pick one particular performance and say this one is the standout because they are equally incredible like you couldn't ask for a better ensemble cast this one is just incredible everyone is so particular and if you describe them on paper you would immediately associate them to a 
a certain face in this movie. And that's just how well the casting is for this movie. And just the dialogue alone is so riveting, you can't help but watch. Because I remember I had to pee and I was in the comfort of my own home watching this movie. And I just didn't want to press pause because there's such a great momentum to the dialogue. And you see these people argue and you hear their sides and you're like, well, yeah, this guy's right. But also, this guy's also right for believing in what he believes. And so everyone has their own convictions inside to the story and reasons to, you know, choose for this kid to be guilty or not. And you're watching this and it's so engaging. The setting of this movie takes place during the hottest day of the summer. So when you see these 12 angry men in a room all together, you know why they're getting angry. They're literally sweating because it's so hot. The AC system isn't working. They're all taking off pieces of their clothing and they're all getting in each other's faces. Things are just getting so heated and you wonder, you know, please, can, can someone just make a decision can, they, can you guys all band together and decide this boy's fate? And that's sort of why you are so riveted in this movie because the dialogue is so engaging and everyone's arguing for their side and everyone's trying to convince Henry Fonda's character that he is wrong, that this boy is guilty. But Henry Fonda is so strong in his conviction that eventually, well, he starts to persuade some people. And that's all I'll say. This movie is incredible. It is, there's a there's a great reason why it's a classic. The movie just exists and Sidney Lumet is so great at directing this film, the way he shoots things, the way that he composes shots to show, you know, all the character conflicts on screen and to highlight their faces throughout the movie. It's just so generous to each of the actors and all the characters in the film because everyone gets their, their spotlight. Everyone gets their time to shine. And that's what's so incredible about this movie is how well balanced it is and I cannot say more I am just rambling like a crazy person but 12 angry men instantly one of my favorite movies ever I love this film and yeah if you guys haven't seen it already which I'm sure you have I recommend you do watch it and the <laughs> criterion release is beautiful loved watching this movie so yeah 12 angry men what 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 else can I say so yeah now this next film is a documentary that was directed in 2019 by Bing Liu, and it really just centers around Bing and his three friends. That film is Minding the Gap. It's a movie that I caught on Hulu at the time, and now I have it on the Criterion disc. And man, this movie is so incredible. It's just one of those movies that you're just wondering, how did the director have the foresight to do this? Because the great thing about the story is it's a it's a story about the director himself. It's a story about the people he grew up with. And it's a story about the skateboarding scene, which is huge in the 90s. And that's sort of where the story starts. And so the fact that he had the foresight to document his life with these two kids growing up and then see that through all the way up till 2019 is incredible. And the fact that he pieced together a narrative and strung along a story amongst these people and like kept up with them and followed up with them throughout the years is just, it's genius. And I, I don't know how much more I can praise this documentary. One of my last points about this documentary that I really liked is that there is a conclusion. There is a revelation that each of these people have to confront by the end. Even being himself as the director goes into the movie and he has a confrontation with his mother and starts talking about his past. And it's just one of the most brilliant parts of the movie. I was so riveted and Kiri Johnson and Zach Mulligan being able to really just express themselves to just be so raw on the screen was incredible. It was so weird to see these people be so insightful and be so open when they're, you know, Bing's friends growing up. And it's it's weird to see that because there's a big reflection of that in the way that I see my own friends growing up. Because I can see, you know, I grew up with some Zacks, I grew up with some Kiris, and I grew up with some Bings. And I didn't grow up in the skating scene, but I can relate to these people in such a unique way that Bing captures it. And I was like, wow, how is he getting all the facets of my own life in this documentary? Why do I see so much of myself or uh, my friends in these people? And it's because he's just getting them to be so open. And I love that about this movie. I felt like I was peeking into lives of my own friends that I never really got to see. And for that, it's, it's incredibly unbiased. It feels so well made. It feels like it's been done by a documentarian who's been doing this for years, but really this is his first feature and it's just incredible. I mean, it deserves all the praises it gets. It's something that I think is still on Hulu, so you should definitely go watch it if you get the chance. Mining the Gap is incredible. Highly recommend my next film. Now this next film really does not need any introduction. It is a classic, it is timeless, it is the defining coming of age film of the 90s. That movie is Dazed and Confused. 
Now, as you guys might know, this film was released in 1993. It was directed by Richard Linklater, and it stars Matthew McConaughey and everyone else who lives in his little world. It is an incredible movie, and I'm so glad that I finally got it on Criterion. It's just a feel-good summertime movie. This film takes place in 1976, and it follows a group of teenagers either graduating from high school or going into high school for the first time. And it's just a movie that captures the essence of summer. Uh, it captures the essence of being a teenager, and it makes you feel nostalgic for a time period that you don't even exist in because you begin to love these characters so much because they're just they're just people who want to relax and have fun and smoke pot and drink beer. Like, how can you not? love that. Even if you don't partake in those activities, you can somehow feel some sort of kinship with them. And that's what I really love about this movie is the ensemble, is the entire cast and the way that Linklater just lingers on these people just relaxing in the parking lot, just having conversation and talking. There's not a lot of filmmakers that can just get people to just give really natural performances and act like just a bunch of stone teenagers. Like, how do you really get that in this day and age? Much like Superbad is my generation's coming of age film, Days and Confused also captures that uncertainty that people in high school who are graduating all have which is what's next and do I even have a future and I really love that it's just a timeless concept it's something you should expect every 10 years a movie like this that sort of just captures that spirit of being in high school having fun having the time of your lives feeling like everything is just gonna go your way you're invincible nothing bad could possibly happen and then reality hits you get student debt you get a job that maybe you like or dislike or maybe you take an internship where everyone treats you like shit it's like all these uncertainties we are just sort of going into and we have little to no confidence but on the outside we have to act like we're cool and that's what this movie really does and I love that I, I love this cast I love seeing Ben Affleck just <laughs> with that goofy haircut chasing people with a paddle I just love how I can sort of just smell the atmosphere of the film I, I can smell the beer that they're drinking I can smell the weed I can just smell the environments that they're in it just does a really great job of just sucking you into that world and I don't know it makes you feel like you're experiencing summer even though I watched this movie recently during winter time when it was freezing so I don't know it's just a nice warm quality to this movie such great like comedic performances Parker Posey is hilarious in this movie you just get so many great 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 little moments in this movie and so many quotable lines from Matthew McConaughey how can you not love this movie Day Singed and Fuse is a classic and I'm so happy I got it on Criterion I mean <laughs> come on guys just look at that it looks so cool dude yeah get it for the packaging alone but yeah I am so glad that I finally have this and yeah Days and Confused, a classic that I can't get back in this case. All right, well, while I'm working on this, let's talk about the next movie. Now, this next film is the last film that I picked up from Criterion. That movie is Eating Raul, directed by Paul Bartel in 1982. The movie stars Paul Bartel himself and actress Mary Warrenoff and Robert Beltran as Raul. Now, there's not a lot to say about this movie other than I had some expectations going in. I thought this movie would be a lot bloodier than it actually was. If you watch this movie, it's labeled as a black comedy or a dark comedy. So you expect some blood, maybe some gore, but also some levity. But I went in and it felt more like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. They're literally just whacking people in the head with a frying pan and no blood whatsoever. They just die immediately. And you watch this and you're like, this is sort of ridiculous and campy, but I'm sort of here for it. I really like it. And so I watched the movie all the way through and I was like, I really thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I think Paul Bartel's dry wit and his voice really comes through in this movie and he plays the character so well. You can see so much of Paul Bartel's dry wit in this film and that's just something that's elevated by Mary Warnow's performance as they are sort of a couple trying to get the funding for the restaurant that they need and the only way that they can do it is if they pretend to be swingers and then they kill the people that come to their house that are expecting you know, a good time. Then a wrench is thrown in their whole operation when Robert Beltran, who plays Raul, comes in as sort of this con man who sleazes into their life and sort of seduces Mary Warnoff's character and then, you know, hijinks ensue. And I don't know, I really enjoyed this movie. If you guys are into deadpan delivery, dry wit, if you're into black comedies, and you're into people getting offed in the most ridiculous ways, wearing the most ridiculous costumes, you will love eating Raul. This movie is a high recommendation for me, and I'm so happy I have it on Criterion finally. And yeah, guys, that pretty much wraps up my Criterion haul for February. I guess it's fitting that my backlight decided to die at this point, so I guess that is my cue to wrap up this video. 
video, guys. Thank you so much for watching this. Remember to like it and to also subscribe if you have not. Uh, I really enjoy making videos like this and I hope to make more in the future. What did you guys pick up during the February flash sale? Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, guys, I will see you later.